It is my greatest pleasure to introduce you. Maria Aloni is our 2023 and scholar of consequence, annual scholar of consequence for the um, Ufology Group. Um, Maria is uh, an associate professor at the ILSC Amsterdam, and uh, she has really done work that I think fits this description all too well because she has brought uh, logic into linguistics and linguistic concerns into logic. And I think that really um, makes this indication very, very appropriate. So um, that starts uh, with her uh, 2000 dissertation on under conceptual covers, then um, under the supervision of Jerome Cronenberg and uh, Paul Becker at the LMC Amsterdam. And I think that reflects the interest in uh, knowledge and belief um, in interaction with quantification and reference, which are challenging topics in natural language semantics. And she just has done, has done a lot bringing in quantified model logic, uh, bimodal state logic to uh, tackle these topics in linguistics, as well as others like um, information structure, um, topic and focus, presuppositions, um, of course, attitudes, uh, belief descriptions um, of imperatives. So uh, lots of interesting topics that are um, very, very interesting for us. And um, I should say that probably this, this um, inclination to bring together linguistics and uh, philosophy also starts in her early career in Milan with uh, Andrea Bonomi and Gennaro Chiazia, um, two great figures to get this kind of enterprise started. Uh, she has, uh, at, uh, let's see, held um, the Vini and the Vidi grants on uh, semantic structure and dynamics in natural language interpretation and the Vidi grant on indefinites and beyond evolutionary pragmatics and pathological semantics. So a project that tackles the challenging topic of indefinites and everything that topologists have found on them from a logical perspective and trying to capture these constraints. And we had the pleasure of hearing about that yesterday um, at the seminar where she gave a presentation um, working towards the linguistics community. We have had a lot of great interactions, so no introduction needed for the people who have had the chance to talk to her over the last few days. And uh, we have now um, our pleasure to take to the current grant started uh, January 2023, entitled like this. Nothing logical, I'm glad it's up here because I didn't quite know how to read it out. Um, <laughs> and this following the Vini and the Vini, I think it's a very suitable topic for the annual logic lecture. So with that, Maria, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Margot, for the very kind words, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's been uh, great, so I've been here already for a couple of days. It was great, so they, you're really taking extremely good uh, care of me, and also uh, I had a really great meeting uh, with uh, many people, so happy to be here. And thank you again for the invitation and for having me. Uh, so, in it, so today I'm going to present uh, um, some results uh, of the current project I'm working on, uh, which is uh, called the Nothing is Logical. This is a project I started a couple of years ago uh, and uh, is a collaborative work with many people at ILSC, students and colleagues. So they are all mentioned in the last slide. Uh, so in this project, um, so the So the goal of the project was to arrive at a formal account of a number of inferences in natural language that deviate from classical logic. Uh, so people reason very often in ways that do not follow the, uh, the rules of logic. And a common assumption that originated in the work of Bryce is that these are not logical mistakes or failures uh, in reasoning, or bad reasoning. But they are a consequence of a pragmatic enrichment. So the fact that when we use language in context and actual conversation, uh, expression, linguistic expression, when indeed you use in context, it can express more than what is literally said. So we followed this common assumption. And then our strategy was to develop uh, logics of conversation which would model the uh, literal meanings ruled by classical logic, but next to literal meanings, also pragmatic factors and all the inferences that would arise from the combination of the two. So this was the strategy. Um, then, uh, so one of the things, so the novel hypothesis that came out from this work 
uh, was uh, that the crucial pragmatic factor for the kind of inferences that we were uh, investigating was this uh, neglect of zero tendency, which also, yeah, I will say something about this uh, uh, later on. And one of the consequences, maybe the main, con main conclusion for this particular talk is that uh, is a this deviation from classical logic that we started with again so they are not uh, logical mistakes they are consequence of pragmatic enrichment but uh, these this are pragmatic enrichments that are different from the standard Gaussian uh, conversational implication now I, then i always start with this uh, uh, quote from uh, uh, sanaker uh, because it gives a very good formulation of also the, the broad motivation behind this project. So this, this was the paper on indicative conditionals from 75. And then in the, in the conclusion, so uh, Stanaker writes, so one final remark, my specific motivation for developing this account of indicative conditional is of course to solve a puzzle. And we will see in a minute what was the puzzle that motivated my research. Uh, but I have a broader motivation, which is perhaps more important, that is to defend, by example, the claim that the concepts of pragmatics can be made as mathematically precise as any of the concepts of syntax and formal semantics. So this is really gives very much the broad motivation behind this project. So this uh, uh, contextual aspect, and in, in our case, also cognitive aspect that play a role in uh, natural language interpretation, traditionally they are held to resist uh, mathematical theorizing, uh, but with this research, what we want to show is that uh, logical tools can be applied also to model these factors and eventually to arrive at an explanation of this non-logical behavior, just using logic. So logic is such a great and flexible tool that uh, uh, can be used to explain also violation and deviation from classical logic. Okay, so this, is, this was a broad motivation. Now let's uh, move to my specific motivation, not indicative conditionals, but ooh, phenomena of a free choice. And um, I think most of you, maybe even all of you know uh, uh, this data, but I will go quickly through them. So uh, free choice exam, free choice inferences are inferences in natural language. Um, and uh, one and two are examples from the, from the literature. Um, it, the idea is that also we have these sentences with a, a disjunction and a model, and uh, they are they give rise to con conjunctive inferences. So let's just read one. It's an example of the only free choice from Hans Kamp. It's the inference from you may go to the beach or to the cinema to you, you may go to the beach and you may go to the cinema. This is an example of a deontic free choice. In two, we have an example of an epistemic free choice by Edith Zimmerman, Mr. X might be in Victoria or in Brixton. This is the premise and then the conclusion, Mr. X might be in Victoria and he might be in Brixton. The logical rendering, reasonable logical rendering of these uh, inferences is in three. Uh, and then of course, that, that is not an example of a logical validity. Now, uh, so th this is the puzzle. And uh, um, so th this inference is so first the philosopher and the linguist came up with, with that and observed that, but they are very robust. So nowadays, uh, many um, experimental semanticists have been run experiment and they're really, so the people really reason in that way. Um, and so the three choice reference, I received a lot of attention, uh, both in linguistics and philosophy in particular, uh, in philosophical logic. So, and they are very interesting for logician because it's not completely trivial to develop a logical system where something like three is a validity. So if we want to capture this inferences in a logical system, we have to do some, something non-trivial. And I will show this um, in a minute for focusing on the case of permission. Uh, so, okay, we have said in natural language, people draw the inference in four. So you may A or B, uh, two, you may A and you may B. But as we said, so five, the logical rendering of this inference is not a validity in a standard deontic logic. And so now what, what is the challenge? Is that it's not, so we cannot add, uh, so if we want to develop a logical system where this is a validity, we cannot just add it to our uh, standard logic because we will get an explosion. So uh, plainly making uh, this principle valid, for example, by adding it as an axiom, 
will result uh, uh, in the Dynamics explosion. And in six, uh, it, this is explained. Now, suppose you start with the permission to do A, then by classical reasoning, you will get the permission to do A or B. This is just addition plus the monotonicity of the diamond. And then from the free choice principle, we will be able to derive the permission to do B. So from any permission whatsoever, we will be able to derive any other permission whatsoever. It's not a useful uh, logical system of permission. Okay, so um, now if we look at the step leading to two, uses uh, the following principle that is valid in classical logic uh, in seven. So, namely, so if you have a diamond alpha, then you, uh, then you also have diamond alpha or beta. Now, if you look at the natural language counterpart of seven, uh, of, yeah, of seven in eight, however, seems invalid. This is also a bit strange. So if you say you may post this letter, you should not conclude that you may post this letter or burn it. And this is an example resembling a Ross paradox that originally was uh, formulated for imperatives. And so the idea is that we have intuition on natural language that are in direct opposition with what, what with the prediction of classical logic. So this is the puzzle. Um, and then, so uh, as I said, many, many people have worked on this phenomenon, and there are very many different possible solutions. I mentioned here some. The first one uh, is the, the, the classical uh, you know, Gratian pragmatic solution is basically to deny that free choice inferences are uh, logical validity or semantic containments. They are just pragmatic inferences of the conversational implicature kind. So we we should so we should leave and keep the logic as is and try to account for this pragmatic effect by a different uh, part of, in our architecture. So the step leading to three is unjustified. And so we don't have to do uh, no work for the logician, but we, we have to figure out what is this uh, conversational reasoning that would give rise to uh, these inferences. And a lot of work has been done in that direction, and there are systems that derive these inferences pragmatically. <laughs> Um, a solution that is uh, very uh, popular nowadays uh, in linguistics is this uh, grammatical view, uh, uh, which views uh, uh, free choice inter inferences um, as a kind of scalar implicature and claim that they are they result from the application of some covert uh, grammatical operator. Again, here uh, the logic can be uh, left at ease, and the idea is that uh, we will get the so the step leading to three is again unjustified. We can get from two to three only if we add something here. So, and normally people add something that behaves similarly to only a natural language. Now then uh, in philosophy, philosophical logic, uh, the semantic solution are more uh, uh, popular. The idea here is that we uh, recognize that free choice inferences are semantic entailments, and we want to change the logic and arrive at the logical system where these things come, the, the, the free choice principle come out as a validity. Um, and then, so I developed uh, one of such systems in 2007, but many other people did. I mentioned myself because it would be the target of my criticism in <laughs> comment. <laughs> uh, so in this system, uh, the step leading to three is justified. So we, are, we, we develop a logic where free choice is a validity, but then we have to do something with, so what I did in 2007 was the step leading to two then is no longer valid. So addition doesn't hold anymore, or you have to do something. So you have to let the transitivity uh, of the inference uh, relation fail. All right, but this is no longer uh, what I'm going to defend. Now, what is the, the nihil is another name, and it's a short name for nothing is logical. So what is the nihil proposal? Uh, so like, uh, so according to the nihil proposal, free choice inference are negative, like zero effects. I will explain in a minute what it is. So like the pragmatic solution, um, so uh, we assume that uh, free choice inferences are pragmatic inferences. However, they are not inferences of the conversational implicature kind. Like uh, the semantic solution, we are going to change the logic, but not to claim the free choice inferences are semantic entailment, but rather to arrive at a, mod a, a rigorous modeling of this pragmatic factor that uh, give rise to these inferences. What we are going to do is to define uh, within the logic is a pragmatic enrichment function, this plus here, and then we will be able 
So we will have a modeling of the pragmatic, relevant pragmatic factor and uh, uh, pragmatic enrichment uh, function. And then we will get the free choice inferences as um, only predicted for the uh, pragmatically enriched version of the free, the, of the free choice uh, sentence. And then, of course, the pragmatically enriched version of uh, the free choice sentence will not be derivable from step one. And so we have solved, we, we have a, a solution of the paradox of uh, free choice permission uh, in terms of, uh, this is just a case of equivocation. And in a way, this is a solution similar to the grammatical uh, view solution. And also for the grammatical view, we, we would get the step from two to three just by adding something there. Okay, so but now what is this neglect zero finally? First, so let me say uh, first uh, what uh, um, I will do. Let me get rid of this. Can I do this, Stefan? No, I, I okay. got rid of all of that. Okay, so um, what? So what, what is then the case? What are this neglect zero? Uh, this neglect zero hypothesis. So. First, uh, let me say what I repeat, what I don't think that free choice inference are. So free choice and related inference, they are not semantic entailments. They are also, they are also not the result of a Bryce and the reasoning. So they are different from uh, conversational implicatures. They are also different from scalar implicatures and they do, are not the effect of application of covert grammatical operators uh, as has been defended by the grammatical view. Rather, they are, uh, that's a claim, they are a consequence of something else that speaker uh, people do in conversation. Namely, the idea is that when we interpret a sentence as a sentence uh, in context or in general, what we do is that we create structure, uh, picture in reality, pictures of the world. And uh, the, um, and then the, the neglect zero hypothesis is that in doing so, people, systematically uh, disregard, neglect uh, structures that verify the sentence by virtue of an empty witness set. And uh, so this is structure that verify a sentence by empty of, uh, by, by virtue of an empty configuration are called, uh, uh, I call them zero models. And uh, then uh, the tendency to neglect uh, these uh, zero models or disregard them and not create them is what I call the neglect zero tendency. And the idea is that why would people have this tendency is because uh, so this tendency follows from a, a cognitive difficulty. It's difficult to, so the operation of evaluating a true sentence with respect to an empty witness set is cognitively taxing. Let me illustrate a bit more what I, uh, what I mean by a zero model and uh, try to illustrate why it is indeed uh, difficult to uh, come up with this model. It's okay, so consider the sentence every square is black and you have to interpret it. So the claim is that uh, when people uh, interpret uh, this sentence in natural language, they construct a model that verifies the sentence. Here it is, for instance, a, a verifier of the sentence. Possibly, they also construct a model that falsifies the sentence, something like that. And then they, you have fully understanding of what, it, what the sentence means. And now, what, so what our claim says, so the neglect zero hypothesis is that when people do this, what they do not do is consider models like the one in C. These are zero models that verify the sentence. Uh, trivially, by means of an empty set, so the, the fact that there are no square. So this is the, the idea. In 12, we have a similar example, yeah, so uh, involving a, a downward intending quantifier. Now, this difficulty of uh, engaging with the zero models has been confirmed by experimental findings, not by me, I'm not an experimental person. So in a number of cognition, but also in experimental semantics, and has, has been argued to explain a number of facts. First, the special status of the zero among the natural numbers. So the fact that uh, emerged in history later than the other uh, positive numbers, the fact that the children uh, learn about the zero later, and also that uh, 
somehow the zero is represented in our brain in a different place with respect to the other natural numbers. In semantics, it has also been uh, uh, used this hypothesis to explain why the interpretation of downward uh, monotonic quantifiers is more costly, and in general, in general, in general negation and negative expression is more costly than the interpretation of uh, uh, upward monotonic quantifiers. So, for instance, the, the contrast between less and more. So somehow it's more difficult to interpret uh, uh, sentences with downward and quantifier, something like less rather than more. And also it's more difficult somehow to, uh, uh, well, more difficult, it's more costly if you, if you measure the processing uh, to interpret a, a sentence with uh, no rather than some. This is somehow surprising in a way because it's not <laughs> difficult with uh, the interpretation of something in OBK. However, somehow we find these things. And let me say something about no. So no, no sentences. These are example of sentences that only, so all the verifiers of no sentences are zero models because these are only verifiable but not some empty witness set. And, uh, you know, so this to show that it's not that we cannot construct a zero models. Of course we can. However, we do, yeah, the claim we do naturally and systematically only if that's the only option. And the fact that uh, these no sentences are somehow more uh, difficult, so it takes a bit longer, more costly to process, could be explained in the, in the, also in terms of the like, zero hypothesis. The fact that in, in any case, constructing a zero model uh, it, it have, comes with some processing costs. All right, so this is all. The last uh, uh, inference that can be explained in terms of the neglect uh, zero hypothesis, of course, is the existential input, I say, of course, for the philosopher, is the existential input effects that are operative in the, have been argued to be operative in the logic of Aristoteles, namely the inference from every square is black to some square is black. And so for 2000 years of the history of logic, that inference was uh, taken as a validity. Uh, and uh, so maybe the neglect uh, zero hypothesis might explain why it took 2000 years to arrive uh, at uh, the, the first order clinical logic that uh, <laughs> we work with now. All right, so this is all um, neglect zero effect playing a role everywhere. But the core idea then of, of this particular work is that so this tendency to neglect the zero models that so we assume is operative in conversation because follows from uh, how we reason and um, yeah from uh, our this cognitive difficulty so this tendency is also what explains uh, the free choice inference and related inference. Now I'm going to uh, before uh, giving you the the so. Well, how exactly it works and how it can be that uh, the, the, this neglect zero also has impact on uh, this junction and free choice. Let me mention that the three arguments. Well, I have more, so I will pick the three arguments in favor of the neglect zero hypothesis. Uh, and I'm going a bit uh, quickly on that, but you can always ask me later on if you have want more details. So the first argument is an argument of empirical coverage. So we have looked at uh, three so far this. Uh, Plain free choice sentences now here in 13a, and now I call narrow scope free choice. Now, there in the end, we, uh, we have seen that there are many different strategies and systems that to do derive it. So, the Neogratian strategy, the grammatical view, semantic analysis, they all capture in you know, one way or the other 13a. The, the point is, however, that this free choice sentences give rise to a complex pattern of inferences as soon as they interact with other logical operators. So, for instance, under negation, you should you want to have a, a classical behavior. Um, but, however, the free choice inference can be embedded under other operators, for instance, the universal quantifiers or double negation. And then there is this last case which is really very surprising for logicians. So uh, this is the case of wide scope free choice when we have really a, just a wide scope disjunction that actually behaves like a conjunction. And what the hell, that's really very hard to capture. But particularly, so this um, um, example E is very difficult to, to also arrive at a, a pragmatic uh, story about it. 
And uh, for the, so my own uh, semantic analysis, yeah, that was also the reason why I abandoned it was that um, did not um, account, well, did not account for E for sure, but also did, did not work, uh, uh, did not account for the behavior under negation. So under negation, you want to just to predict the classical behavior. That's the classical behavior of interpretation. All right. So, however, the neglect zero approach in, in the implementation I will present uh, in, in a minute. Uh, capture all this uh, uh, pattern in a quite natural way, uh, whereas uh, other approaches uh, normally need additional assumptions. And in particular, my own one actually was uh, hopeless, so I, <laughs> I, I had to abandon it. Now, here I have just some slides with the data behind the inferences that I gave you. So just to show that all these inferences have been uh, nowadays tested experimentally. So in this field, this free choice field, we are very lucky because there are very clever experimental scientists that are doing all this experiment. So um, all, this, all, all this data are backed up by um, experimental results. Even uh, the, the wide scope free choice example. So th this is the experimental work showing that indeed people draw wide scope free choice inferences. Uh, one last thing I want to say about this experimental work. So for instance, one of the inferences we are interested in is this uh, double, double negation free choice. So the fact that we do have free choice inference under double negation. Now, this is typically something that is very difficult to test because in natural language, we don't have a double negation very often in a natural way. It's very hard to get in, intuition. And just to show that how clever these experimentalists are, so and they, they managed to uh, provide evidence for the double negation free choice by looking, for instance, of example, with a non monotonic quantifier and then the negation of a free choice sentence. And just, okay, just to see how, how clever these experimentalists are. I was not involved in this experiment, but it was very useful um, to have it. Okay, so this was the argument number one. Uh, for the second argument, uh, uh, so let's have a broader view and let's look at more inferences that this junction can give rise to in context. So look at example like 18. Here we have a plane in this junction without any model. So uh, Pat ate the cake and the ice cream. Now, um, so we all know, so this junction in context give rise to scalar implicature. So they're not both in, uh, inference. And uh, also, I argue there is also this ignorance inference, so that we normally draw the conclusion that the speaker doesn't know which of the two. That's the reason why uh, this juncture was used. Okay. Now, the, the new Gratian story about the ignorance inference, the creature's inference, and scalar literature is very elegant and uniform. They are all come from the same source. They are just uh, the result of this reasoning, conversational reasoning of the Gratian kind. On the grammatical view, the free choice inference and the scalar is viewed as a type of scalar implicature. And so they have the same source. They both are grammatical phenomena. Now on the nihil view, so my view, um, instead, so uh, free choice and ignorance inference are both neglect zero, um, effects, and I, we don't have anything to say about the scalar implicature. There's something else. So either they're the result of some Gratian reasoning or result of some grammatical, um, the, the application of some grammatical operator. So we are agnostic with respect to the scalar implicature. Now, one argument that could be given in favor of the neglect zero approach is that um, so again, the experimental literature has shown that uh, there are differences uh, between the free choice and scalar implicature. So while the free choice inferences are um, easy to process and they are acquired early, so children deal, so draw free choice inferences, uh, I, I think at the age of at least uh, four or five, Scalar implicature instead have been shown to well come with the high processing cost and they are also typically acquired later. So indeed, there is this idea that children are more logical than adults because they they don't draw the, the scalar implicature. But for the free choice, we see the opposite. So children are very good with these free choice inferences. 
Now, the, so this easiness of the free choice inference, so the fact that children deal with them so early and they are easy to process is something that really is expected on the neglect zero hypothesis. Because according to this hypothesis, this free choice inference follow from the fact that speakers avoid zero models. And we avoid zero models because they are cognitively taxing. So it's even possible to assume that children do not even, they cannot even assess the zero models. And then we will, it will follow that in the, indeed they are extremely good with these influences. Um, so, and, uh, however, the same, uh, so this difference between scalar and clicature and free choice inference is harder to explain on the other approach that they assume that they come out, so they are the result of the same source. Uh, harder, not impossible, eh? but so. But this was the second argument and I have then, uh, uh, this is, was also the paper, but have an, a new one based on a very recent experiment that we have been doing. Actually, I already mentioned this yesterday during the seminar. So and they really concern the ignorance inference. So if you have something like 19, Pat ate the cake or the ice cream, then people somehow, that this convey that the speaker doesn't know which. And also, if you wanted to check exactly formally, what is this inference? It could be, so we can distinguish between the strong ignorance and the weak ignorance. The strong ignorance is the one in A, 19A, um, and basically it says, so the speaker doesn't know whether uh, Pat ate the cake and the speaker doesn't know whether Pat ate the ice cream. Uh, but it could, it could also be just a weak ignorance. So that really means only, it might be that Pat ate the cake and it might be that uh, Pat ate the ice cream. So, these are two possibilities. And uh, now the, the new Gratian, so the Gratian way to derive the ignorance inference um, derives a strong ignorance from a kind of quantity reasoning. And then weak ignorance follows from the combination of the strong ignorance inference and the original sequence. Instead, uh, and this is something that we discovered later, so the neglect zero hypothesis derives only weak ignorance. So weak ignorance is, and we will see this in a minute, is a neglect zero effect. Strong ignorance is not derived. And then we run this experiment. Uh, so the Gano class and also Jacopo Romoli was involved. And actually we, we have found that uh, weak ignorance is derived independently from strong ignorance. And even we didn't find any evidence of the stronger ignorance inference. And so this experimental finding again is in agreement with the prediction of, uh, uh, of this hypothesis versus so contra the, the Gratian way of deriving this inferences. All right, I'm done with the experiment and now or end with the arguments and now we can go to the logic. And so uh, also we are using this uh, DSNL. So we I developed this DSNL to try to capture and for, uh, for formalize this neglect zero effect. The SML stand is um, a team-based model logic of the bilateral tie, uh, kind. Let me say something about what it means to be team-based and on uh, bilateralism. Now, so team semantics was developed uh, mostly as a semantics for dependence logic um, by uh, Jakob van Anen and, and, and others and colleagues. And in team semantics, formulas um, are interpreted with respect to sets of point of evaluation rather than single points. And these sets are normally called the teams. Um, in the, so BSML is a model logic, so a team-based model logic. So a point of evaluation will be a possible word. And then we, we are going to evaluate uh, formulas with respect to sets of possible words that, rather than single words. So in classical model logic, we are interested as a philosopher in the truth in words. And so we interpret formula with respect to single words. In a team-based model logic, we um, uh, interpret formulas with respect to teams, so sets of possible words. Now, 
So BSMS, so BSML, which is the logical way to introduce, uh, stands for bilateral state-based model logic. It's called the state-based rather than team-based because these teams, it's a set of words, are interpreted as information states of the conversationalists, of the speakers. And this is very much in the tradition, uh, the Amsterdam tradition, so, uh, of uh, uh, various logic that have been developed to account for natural language uh, effects, like dynamic semantics, inquisitive semantics. That's it, data semantics. Um, but okay, so VSML is also bilateral, and that means that rather than model a truth condition, the logic is meant to model assertion and rejection conditions. So we will have, uh, uh, so we will define the support relation uh, from so information state to sentences, and this should read should should be read as phi is assertable in S, where S again is a set of possible words. But we also have anti-support uh, um, relation, and this should be read as a, a phi is rejectable in S. Again, S is a sense. So the idea in this analogy is that the inference relation then is not among the proposition, but operates at the level of speech acts, at the level of assertion and rejection. And uh, so because of that, then uh, the notion of an inference that eventually we will uh, um, uh, Define might diverge from classical semantic entailments. That's because the assertion condition of certain uh, formulas is different from their truth condition, in particular in the case of disjunction. And that, that we will see very clearly that the truth condition of a disjunctive sentence is very different, particularly from the assertion condition of a disjunctive sentence. All right. Uh, okay, one thing about. Um, so in BSML, we have a failure of the principle of bivalence. In fact, uh, the, the, yeah, okay. So we can have a state that neither support nor uh, reject a sentence, anti-support a sentence. So in a sense, uh, yeah, clearly, the information states are less determinant than uh, possible words. And so they are very similar to other structure that have been discussed in the philosophical uh, uh, logic literature, like truth makers, situations, or possibilities. So from a technical point of view, normally, uh, so truth makers and possibilities, so possibilities I, I have in mind the possibility semantics by Humberson. So these things nor normally are formulated as points in a partially ordered set. Information states are sets of possible words. But again, there are also elements for partially ordered sets, so the Boolean lattice. So all these structures are very similar. So one thing that, um, so, so these systems uh, that are now uh, quite popular in the philosophical logic uh, um, landscape um, are, called, are closely connected, although they might diverge in motivation. So to make our semantics and possibility semantics, in, in their, I think, the most successful uh, application, they, they, they are dealing with metaphysics. So they are interested in the description of the ontological structures of the world. Whereas the SML, uh, inquisitive semantics or dynamic semantics, we are interested in, not in the human behavior. We are interested in explaining patterns of interpretation and inferential uh, um, human activities. All right. But then what I want to do next, so first I will present you BSML and discuss the main application. In particular, uh, I think I will mostly look at uh, the ignorance inference in play. And then uh, we will compare BSML with this other system, to make a semantics, possibility semantics, infinity semantics, uh, using translation in this uh, model information logic uh, that was developed by Jan van Benten um, long ago, and then he, uh, Came back to it in 19. All right, let's go to BSML. I will present it quickly and only the model theory. We do have a proof theory, but I'm not going to present it today. So, language. First of all, I'm only looking at the propositional uh, uh, version of BSML. We also have a first order version, but um, yeah, it's a bit too complex to present in uh, half an hour. So, Language is the language of propositional model logic plus one new constant, this ME, that stands for non-empty 
And that will be the element in our logic that we will use to formalize the neglect zero tendency. Um, models will be classical Kripke models. So just a triple consisting of a set of possible words, accessibility, function, and evaluation. And now the, the difference with the classical model logic is that we are going to interpret our formula with respect to set of words. We call them states rather than uh, single words. And now we will represent model state pairs by means of these pictures. So uh, this uh, four thing here are the four possible words. We are assuming a very simple language with just the two uh, prepositional atoms. And then, uh, uh, so this is a word, so the subscript here in the words are meant to represent the evaluation function. Basically, this is a word in which both A and B are true. Here is a word where only A is true. Here a word where only B is true. And here they are both false. Arrows represent uh, the accessibility relation. And then this gray area here, this is the state. Okay. And also, for instance, this is, uh, will be a model state combination that uh, does not satisfy A, but satisfy diamond A. So it does not satisfy A because we assume that for a propositional letter to be supported in a state, it has to be true everywhere. And then, so for instance, here it is not. Here it is not true, so A is not supported. Whereas a diamond A is supported because each word in our state can view a, a word. So here, this is, would be the A word that is can be viewed and here it is. Now here in this other example, instead the A, simple A is supported, whereas the diamond A is not supported because, well, the, the word in my state cannot see any A word. And then here, okay, this is a, it's a bit silly, but it's a representation of the empty state. So that's crucial that we can interpret the formulas also with respect to um, a model and an empty state. And in the empty state, as we see, we follow from the definition, uh, classical contradiction are supported. Okay, so this, this are the semantic, the, the, the clauses in the model theory. Basically, okay, so an atomic proposition is uh, uh, supported in a state if it's true everywhere. And it is uh, anti-supported in a state if it's false everywhere. Negation is defined in terms of anti-support, so not phi is supported if phi is anti-supported and the other way around. Um, this juncture, okay, this is, will be the crucial uh, uh, clause, and I will, uh, I will have it in the next slide, so maybe I, I, it's good to repeat it twice. So, for, so when is a disjunction supported in a state? If the state is the union of two substates, uh, each supporting one of the disjuncts. So if S is a union of T and T prime, such that T supports the first disjunct and T prime supports the second one. And when it is a, a disjunction uh, uh, anti-supported if each of the disjunct is anti-supported. Conjunction is, uh, um, well, the, the support clause is uh, classical and the anti-support clause is, uh, follows the, the support clause of disjunction. Basically, when is a conjunction anti-supported? If uh, S in S, if S is a union of two states, each uh, anti-supporting uh, uh, one of the conjuncts. The model uh, is the source important, but maybe I won't say too much about that. So this is the, okay, when is a, a model center supported in a state? If and only if for all world in the state, we can find a non-empty subset of the set of words accessible from W, such that uh, that um, uh, non empty subset support the sentence. And uh, uh, diamond phi is uh, anti supported uh, if and only if for all word W in S, uh, the set of words uh, accessible from W anti support phi. And then, okay, here we are now with any, that's the, the novel. Element. So when is any supported by a state if any is non-empty and is anti-supported if any is empty? All right, so th these are the semantic clauses. Now we can define the box in terms as the dual of the diamond. 
Uh, and then, okay, so we define logical consequence in terms of uh, uh, preservation of support. And uh, we have a proof theory that's been developed by uh, Alexei Antula in a, his master thesis, and now we have a, a... And then, okay, so in this system, we can also define state-based constraints on the accessibility relation. Uh, and I will say something about this later if I have time. So, but let's move um, to the core idea now of how to model this neglect zero hypothesis. Okay, so we have seen that the state supports a disjunction in this system, if and only if the state is the union of two substates, each supporting one of the disjuncts. Okay, so look at now these three models. So we are disregarding here the accessibility relation because we are just looking at the plane A or B. Now, the, this model in A with the state, this is a non-zero verifier of the sentence. We can split it up in two. We have here an, a substate which supports A and a subset which supports B. So the state supports the, the disjunction. Here in C, we have an example of a falsifier because so in the state, actually both A and B are false everywhere. And now, so now the crucial state is the one in B. So the, this state is an example of a zero model for the disjunction according to our definition. What does it mean? This is a state which verifies the disjunction by virtue of an empty witness. And so why does it verify the disjunction? Because we can find the substates of this state supporting each disjunct. The state itself supports A and the empty state supports B. Basically, the empty state supports every, every contradiction and supports all classical sentences in this system by definition. So, uh, okay, so this is a zero model. And then, then the core idea is what we want to do now to arrive at the definition of a pragmatic enrichment, which rules out a zero model. So we want to rule out this possibility. And the idea is that by ruling out this possibility, we hope to get all the ignorance and free choice inferences. So the core effect, so the goal is to define enrichment whose core effect is to rule out the possibility of zero models. Okay, and then, so if we manage to do that, what we will get is that S supports an enriched disjunction, if and only if S is the union of two non-empty substates, each supporting one of the disjuncts. So we will get that this is the, the non-zero verifier will also support the pragmatically enriched version of the disjunction. This falsifier would uh, reject uh, the, the, the also the pragmatically enriched version of the disjunction, but we want to get that the, um, so this model that was the zero model does no longer support the pragmatically enriched version of the disjunction. And the idea is that, so what we want to get is that an enriched disjunction, uh, if we get this, then what we capture is that an enriched disjunction requires both of these junk to be like a possibility so that you are in an information state where both A and B are epistemic possibility. And this is what is not um, um, satisfied here. All right, now, um, one thing. So I, I'm using this example as a, a non-zero verifier. However, we have many more non-zero verifiers for the enriched version of the disjunction in this system. Uh, so we will have also, for instance, the state here in G would also verify our um, enriched version of the disjunction. And notice that this is a state in which the, the speaker say, would know B. So this was a state that supports B. So um, this means that in our system, only weak ignorance is derived. If you recall, we, we introduced a distinction between weak ignorance and strong ignorance. Um, so weak ignorance is just that, so we derive that each disjunct must be an open possibility. Strong ignorance uh, would be stronger is that, that the speaker doesn't know uh, each of the disjuncts. And then, so this is very different from the standard Gratian derivation of the ignorance effect. And we did uh, run an experiment that it seems that people behave 
more uh, in agreement with our prediction than with the classical Gratian account. All right. Uh, now, so now let's look at the implementation. So how are we going to define uh, this uh, pragmatic enrichment plus a function? So we, we are going to use any. There are different ways of doing it, and that's another talk. Here I just look, go with the with, with the, the NE story. So we're going to use this non-emptiness atom. Basically, this is an, an atom that actually was defined in team logic independently from this application. Um, so NE requires the supporting state to be non-empty. Now, what we are going to do is to define in, in terms of NE, using NE, this pragmatic enrichment function. Basically, what it says is a pragmatically enriched formula then comes with the requirement to satisfy the requirement of an E, so non-emptiness distributed along each of its subformula. So this is how it is defined. So we start, so it's recursively defined. So P plus P and you end an E uh, negation. So and then, yeah, what you would expect. We just end, 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 end an E everywhere, everywhere. But then what is the main result, the nice result about this is so we can add this requirement everywhere, but it only has an effect on positive disjunction. And so that what in BSML, this, this plus enrichment indeed uh, uh, only uh, has effect on positive disjunction. This allows us to capture free choice effect for the pragmatically enriched version of, of the language, but also we, get that pragmatic enrichment is vacuous under single negation. Again, under double negation, it will arise again. This is a, exactly the, the prediction that actually we wanted to have. So there's a complex uh, set of data that we started with. Now, so we derive uh, uh, both wide and narrow scope free choice inferences. Notice how uh, plus all the other things that uh, we haven't really looked at, but uh, they all follow. Notice that the wide scope free choice inference is only derived if we assume uh, that, uh, so if we make a certain assumption on the accessibility relation. What we don't, well, we also get the classical behavior under negation. And I have a slide uh, accounting for it, but I'm, I'm afraid I don't have so much time left. So, um, so this is, the pragmatic enrichment a bit. But also before pragmatic enrichment, we do something nice. Well, first uh, we can show that the NE free fragment of BSML, which looks so non-classical, actually give us classical logic. So if we just get rid um, of NE, we uh, define a notion of logical consequence, which is equivalent to, to the, the one of classical model logic. So this I find it very nice because it really means that we have isolated the pragmatic effect. So we have a literal meanings captured by classical logic, and then we have this pragmatic factor that we can put or get rid of it, and then we have a, a full understanding, hopefully, of what is going on. Now, in uh, um, so also independently of pragmatic enrichment, so if we just look at the NE free fragment of the logic, we can also capture something more. In particular, this epistemic contradiction that have been argued to um, arise for epistemic models like might. This is the fact that it's sort of incoherent to say it might be raining and it is not raining. So this kind of fact can also be captured independently of pragmatic enrichment in this system because, uh, uh, because we are in a team-based system. And, uh, but uh, the way to do this in the SML is just by, uh, so this epistemic contradiction follow only if we assume uh, specific constraints on the accessibility relation, in particular, this state basedness. Now I have a couple of slides I'm showing. So here we have this indisputability and we have the state basedness. Um, I have a couple of slides showing how they interact and which uh, um, result they give us for epistemic contradiction, but also for uh, free choice in the deontic and in the epistemic case. But I see that it's 12 o'clock. So I, what I could do is, send, is just jump to the more logic bit. And uh, you can read the paper about this or ask me during the discussion about this. And just I, I, just five minutes, I say, 
something about this work in progress on the comparison with this uh, uh, other system. Uh, this was uh, also Magda work was uh, because she worked on <laughs> okay negation uh, other things okay let me say something I just want to say something this is really very much work in progress and uh, I'm also willing to hear what you think about it okay so the idea is that we wanted to understand what was this, this PSML in comparison with other systems and uh, what we're going to do is to use uh, um, this model information logic uh, at the moment the logic itself, and later on we will have to add some, the modality uh, as a common ground. This is actually a, a semi-classical logic. This will be used as a common ground where different related system can be translated into, and then we can say something about uh, their internal relation. Um, so and what I'm going to do in five minutes <laughs> is just so what we are going to produce our simplified translation into this uh, uh, modern logic of the following system. So we will look at BSML, truth maker semantics, the version by Kid Fine, possibility semantics, the version of Humberson uh, and Halliday, and then the inquisitive semantics. They're going to be very fast. And the, the so this is inspired by uh, Goethe's famous translation of uh, intuitionistic logic into modal logic. So the idea that we can reconstruct uh, all this non-classical system in a semi-classical system. Okay, and the focus will be on the proposition of fragments, so no modalities, those bring in extra complication, I cannot deal in five minutes. We will focus on this junction and negation, which is, is the combination of this junction and negation of BSML, which is the most uh, non-standard and novel. And this is based on work with many colleagues that I mentioned on the slides. All right, so uh, what is this model information logic? This is just uh, uh, classical logic, plus uh, this uh, um, uh, soup operator, which stands for supremum, so list upper bound. And it's a, actually it's a model operator, but a model binary operator. So let, let's have a closer look. So in this logic, formulas are interpreted um, on uh, uh, triples. So a model is a set of points ordered by a partial order, and then there is evaluation function. And then all these clauses are classical. So here we have classical negation. Uh, so not five if is uh, true in X, uh, if phi is not true. True. Uh, the, so this is all classical, but now let's have a look at the soup operator. Um, so uh, soup uh, uh, phi and psi is uh, uh, true in X, if and only if uh, there are uh, points uh, uh, Y and Z uh, such that X is the supremum according to the partial order of a y and z, and uh, uh, y supports phi and z to support the psi. But this really looks like my definition of this junction. You should see this in <laughs> So we are going to use this for translating uh, uh, the BSML disjunction. Now, in terms of super, we can also define a, a box modality for the disordering. And basically then, so box phi will be supported in x. If for all y, uh, lower than x, uh, um, phi is true in y. Just picture to understand. So we will have this uh, structure, and then here in x, uh, soup p and q uh, would be uh, true because we can, so because x is the least upper bound of uh, y and z, and the p is true here, and q is true here. And then the box. So box P is true up here because it is true everywhere down the, the point of evaluation. Okay, so th this is very, very simple, well, not completely. And now, okay, we can translate uh, the, the non-modal fragment of a, a, a couple of logics in this system. And this is, uh, now I'm just only sketching it. Since we are, so let's start with BSML. So since we are in a bilateral system, we will have plus and minus translation. Okay, what is nice is that we can define uh, by making a certain assumption on the pre-order. So in particular, it would be it's a, it's a subset relation and we have a, a full uh, uh, power set uh, structure. Uh, we can define our notion of this junction in terms of the soup operator. That's, that's very nice. Now if, now, if we compare it with the truth maker semantics, we see that that's the mirror because there, 
So it's the notion of conjunction, which is defined in terms of summation. I mean, this is only makes sense for the people that know something about truth maker semantics, but there is a the conjunction is defined into, so you have this neurological structure, and then a the conjunction is defined as a, in, in terms of a summation, and, and in this case will be the, the superoperator. So here is the positive conjunction that is defined in terms of uh, uh, soup um, and the negative uh, disjunction. Whereas uh, in my system is the positive disjunction and the negative conjunction. So these are both what they have in common. The SML and truthmaker semantics is this bilateralism. Now I now will just look quickly at two other systems that are not bilateral. And then we have, so for the possibility semantics, uh, then, yeah, we just have a unilateral translation. And then you see that the notion of negation is, is different, it's not bilateral negation, but it's just a, 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 the system can be expressed in terms of universal quantification as an intuitionistic logic. So it is a semi intuitionistic notion of negation. And this junction is also uh, different uh, from uh, the one uh, in uh, BSML. And it's, uh, it's, this is called the co-final disjunction. And this is a notion of disjunction that is similar to the one that is also used in dynamic semantics. So basically a disjunction is uh, true in, uh, in the system. If for every state we can find a final state where at least one of the disjuncts is true. And now comparing with inquisitive semantics and even intuitionistic logic, because in this fragment, then intuitionistic logic and inquisitive semantics share with the possibility semantics the notion of negation, but it comes with a different notion of uh, disjunction. Now, just to summarize, so we have looked at four systems, and then in this uh, in other logic, we can uh, we, we see that we have encountered already three different notions of disjunction. So the Boolean disjunction, the, the split lifted disjunction from the SNL, defined in terms of soup, and then this co-final disjunction that was defined in possibility semantics, which was also a model notion, but different from, uh, from the, the split disjunction. And similarly for negation. So we, uh, Boolean, we have Boolean negation from classical logic, bilateral negation, the one that uh, the SML uses, but also truth maker semantics, and in intuitionistic-like negation, which is a basic universal uh, model uh, notion. And the idea is that, so if we take Boolean disjunction together with Boolean negation, we get classical logic. However, Boolean notion in other combination, okay, is well known, can generate you no know, classicality. So for instance, if we take Boolean disjunction plus intuitionistic negation, we get intuitionistic logic, which is non-classical. However, classicality can also be generated by non-Boolean combination. And one example is the NE3 fragment of the SML, where we can combine a split disjunction, bilateral negation, and we still get the classical logic. So satisfying the lower, the through the middle and all the other validity. Okay, so this is just, uh, now I conclude. Conclusion, free choice. We started with that, a mismatch between logic and language. The insight from Grice was a stronger meaning can be derived paying more attention to the nature and importance of the condition governing conversation. In the standard imp imp implementation, we normally we have to separate components. We have semantics ruled by classical logic, and then we have pragmatics uh, ruled by regression reasoning. A very elegant picture, but empirically uh, not um, uh, inadequate. And then my proposal, free choice and related uh, inference, in particular ignorance, uh, neglect a zero effect. So we have developed a, a logic where we had, so we could capture the literal meaning, the NE free fragment of the language, plus the crucial pragmatic factor, this NE, neglect zero tendency, and then we obtained all these additional pragmatic inferences. And now here are all the people that uh, have been collaborating and working on uh, related material in the last past years and in the future, I hope. That's it. Sorry to land.